next blitzer. Hey, so uh, first up to go uh, is Mariana Mendes uh, Bahia. Uh, did I pronounce that correctly? Yay. Okay. Uh, so she's going to be the first one to present. And then after her, I'll introduce the next speaker. Mariana, uh, you have the floor. And we've enabled screen sharing so you can share slides. And just a reminder before you start, uh, Mariana, um, I will be giving a one minute warning uh, to each uh, speaker before okay. the time's up. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I'm Mariana Mendes. I'm a PhD candidate in the voice and swallowing physiology lab at Syracuse University. So today I'll be speaking about masseter muscle activity during regular and effortful saliva swallows. So surface EMG is the most common form of biofeedback used in swallowing rehabilitation. It enhances the learning and execution of swallowing strategies, for example, the effortful swallow maneuver. The electrodes record uh, electroactivity of a group of superficial muscles, which are displayed on a computer screen, providing real-time re uh, visual feedback on the degree and duration of muscle activity. So typical SEMG electrode placement is in the submental region uh, due to underlying muscles involved in specific swallowing events. However, the use of other swallowing instrumentation, for example, ultrasonography or laryngeal pressure transducers may prevent the use of submental SEMG. So for this reason, other muscles that do not interfere with hyolaryngeal instrumentation um, could be alternatives for tracking swallows for example, the masseter muscle. So we know that during swallowing, uh, the masseter, so the mandibular elevators are contracted, for example, the masseter muscle, which is important for closing the jaw and assisting with intraoral pressure. Also, the masseter muscle is a superficial muscle, being an ideal candidate for a surface EMG. So the effortful swallow maneuver is the most common, uh, the most recommended strategy in swallowing management. It was first developed to improve the contact between the base of the tongue and the posterior pharyngeal wall during swallowing, thus increasing driving a pressure in the region, facilitating bolus passage and clearance. The training and execution of the effortful swallow often rely on verbal instructions and sensation of muscle effort. It is therefore important to the term, the relationship between perceived swallowing effort and objective measures of muscle activity during swallow. My other goal in the study was to investigate whether the masseter muscle could differentiate a normal swallow from an effortful swallow. Participated in the study, 20 healthy young adults, ages 18 to 41. All participants had no history of swallowing disorders and they showed normal auto structure and function. So surface EMG was obtained in the submental and masseter regions across five normal and five uh, effortful saliva swallows. My main outcome measures for SMEG uh, were peak um, SMEG amplitude in microvolts and duration in seconds. Also, participants used a visual analog scale uh, to rate their perceived swallowing effort after each swallow. So results showed activation of the master muscle during swallowing and its effectiveness in differentiating a regular saliva swallow from an effortful saliva swallow. Um, also, the masseter um, muscle uh, peak amplitude during effortful swallows were on average 220% greater than the individual average uh, during normal swallows, peak amplitude during nor normal swallows. This change corresponds to an increase of masseter SMEG peak amplitude of 16 microvolts. Um, master SMEG durations during effortful swallow, so the red dots, were on average 60% greater than the individual average of durations in normal swallows. So this change corresponds to an increase of almost 0.7 seconds. Finally, uh, repeated measure analysis showed a, a strong positive correlation between um, perceived swallowing efforts, so the visual analog scale measurements, and uh, Master SMG peak amplitude. So overall individuals, they were really good differentiating their normal swallows from their effortful swallows. And for each one millimeter change in perception of swallowing effort, individuals increased the SMG peak amplitude by 0.6 microvolts. One minute so, more. 
Okay, uh, so this finding suggests that the master muscle effectively differentiating a normal swallow from an effortful swallow using SCMG. As we, we saw, peak amplitudes and durations were significantly greater during effortful swallows. And this finding support the use of the master muscle when practicing effortful swallows using SMEG, especially when we are using simultaneous uh, other non-invasive instrumentation. And perceived swallowing effort was strongly associated with objective measures of muscle activity during swallowing, suggesting that the visual analog scale may be a useful method for tracking, differentiating this normal from effortful swallows during rehabilitation. I would like to address some limitations. So this study includes a small sample of healthy young adults. For this reason, um, future studies should explore large cohorts of healthy adults across different ages and also in individuals with dysphagia. It is important to determine how master SMEG peak amplitudes and durations correlate with the submental SMEG amplitudes and durations during swallowing. And finally, it's important to investigate the longitudinal use of the visual analog scale during rehabilitation. Yeah, thank you so much for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Um, Sonia is asking a question. Um, she wants to know if the instructions you gave the participants or what were the instructions you gave the participants to execute an effortful swallow? Yes, so really good question. And I have this information here. <laughs> it was uh, too much for five, five minutes. Um, so for normal swallow, so participants received two instructions normal swallows to gather some saliva, and then after the SMEG signal is stabilized, they receive the instruction to swallow as you normally do. And for effort, effortful swallows, after they gather some saliva, they receive the instruction as you swallow, you squeeze hard with your tongue without clenching your teeth. So um, I added this um, without clenching your teeth instruction. Um, as we know, the masseter is one of the chewing muscles. And I want to be sure that individuals, they were using muscle activation, muscle activity for performing the effortful swallow and not helping or compensating with uh, um, teeth clenching. Thank you. Um, and then Karen wants to know if the masseter could be used as a target for rehabilitation as well. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. For, so for practicing the effortful swallow, yes. Um, although I, I believe that we still need some studies um, to find this correlation, especially if we have a linear association between um, peak amplitude of the master and the submental peak amplitude. But it's a really good question. Great, thank you so much. Um, so if- I think- oh, wait, I Karen, Karen had another question. Um, so any instrumental measures of effectiveness of ES versus NS or fees? Um, so I, I think it, it depends. So with fees, we can observe. Um, it's not the best one, but we can observe some changes. Uh, however, what we don't know if see the individuals they are performing the effortful swallow correctly. So the literature shows that individuals they should at least double the SMEG peak amplitude relative to the normal swallows to have a good effortful swallow. Um, so unless you are doing like fees or even uh, the MBS study, the modifier bearing swallowing study with simultaneous acquisition with uh, surface EMG uh, for you to be sure that it was a correct performance. That's so interesting. It could be a biofeedback study too. <laughs> yes, it's true. Yeah, really important. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, we, if there are any more questions, we can uh, have a discussion at the end, um, but we will move next to Danielle. Hi everyone, sorry, just uh, finding my uh, presentation here to share. Uh, 
Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, my name is Danielle Brates. Uh, thank you so much for hosting this event uh, for junior researchers such as myself. Um, I am a recent graduate of the um, PhD program at New York University, um, where I was uh, studying um, adult dysphagia under the mentorship of Dr. Sonia Malfender. So uh, my dissertation was entitled The Role of Fatigue in the Aging Swallow. Um, and I'm going to briefly summarize one study I conducted as part of this work, which was a survey of the perception of swallowing related fatigue among older adults. So fatigue is recognized as clinically relevant to swallowing performance. We often talk about uh, things like planning dysphagia treatment sessions strategically to avoid fatigue or making recommendations that our patients consume smaller, um, more frequent meals to prevent fatigue. Uh, but we have limited empirical evidence to support the occurrence of fatigue during swallowing and whether it affects swallowing function. Um, and fatigue is a tricky term to operationalize, but one way it can be measured is by um, self-perception. So I conducted um, a survey of older adults to understand uh, first, what is the prevalence of perceived swallowing and eating related fatigue or SURF among community dwelling older adults? Two are symptoms of SURF among older adults associated with um, age, gender, dysphagia risk, sarcopenia, malnutrition risk, general fatigue, and or quality of life. Three, do symptoms of SURF among older adults predict dysphagia risk? And four, do symptoms of SURF among older adults predict malnutrition risk? Um, so I conducted a cross-sectional observational online survey of adults age 60 and older. Um, and I used validated scales to measure the following constructs, dysphagia risk, sarcopenia, general fatigue, malnutrition risk, and quality of life. Um, but of course, we don't have any validated scales to measure swallowing and eating related fatigue. So um, I had to develop uh, a scale to measure that. Um, and I conduct, I did that using in-depth interviewing and pre-testing with the target population and ultimately ended up with a 12 item surf scale um, each item ranged from zero to four with an overall score range of zero to 48. Um, and this is the total, or this is the complete list of scale items. Um, and items uh, range from things like chewing makes my jaw feel tired to um, I take breaks during meals because I feel tired. Um, so we collected complete data from 417 respondents with a mean age of 71 years. Um, all respondents were community dwelling with the majority residing in the United States. Here is just some of the uh, demographic or descriptive information uh, that we collected. Um, in terms of um, our first question, the prevalence, um, we found a median surf score of six with a range of zero to 48 out of that to total possible of 48. And 75% of respondents reported at least some degree of swallowing and eating related fatigue. Um, as indicated by agreement with one or more of our SURF scale items. Um, SURF significantly correlated with dysphagia risk on the E10, as well as general fatigue, frailty status, or that should be sarcopenia, uh, nutritional status, and quality of life. Um, there was no significant correlation between SURF and age or SURF and gender. Um, to determine whether symptoms of SURF um, uh, among these older adults predicted dysphagia risk, we ran a binary logistic regression. Um, and uh, I found that SURF scores significantly predicted dysphagia risk status on the EAT-10 um, while controlling for all other variables. So um, for every unit increase in SURF score, uh, there were 21% increased odds of being at risk for dysphagia on the EAT-10. Um, in terms of malnutrition risk, um, we found that SURF, general fatigue, and quality of life significantly predicted malnutrition risk. Um, and for every unit increase on the SURF scale, there was 6% increased odds of being at risk for malnutrition. Uh, so in summary, this was the first study to examine perceptions of swallowing-related fatigue among older adults. Um, some degree of swallowing and eating-related fatigue does appear to be uh, experienced by the majority of respondents. Um, and our SURF scale demonstrates at least preliminary validity based on its significant correlations with uh, dysphagia-related health outcomes such as E10, frailty, or sarcopenia, malnutrition, general fatigue, and quality of life. Um, 
And perceived swallowing related fatigue appears to be a predictor of dysphagia risk and malnutrition risk in community dwelling older adults. Um, but future research is needed to not only further validate this scale, um, but also examine the effects of fatigue under instrumentation. So that is it for me. Um, thanks very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Um, I just see that there's one uh, question in the chat uh, that there was no correlation with age. Uh, yeah, so I, I believe if we had a greater distribution of age, this would have come out as significant. Uh, but the fact that we, all of our participants were 60 and older, I think we just weren't, we didn't have the distribution, the age distribution to um, have that be significant. If we had included 20 year olds, I would have definitely expected age to come out. Um, in-depth interviewing. Yeah, this was, um, so how we went about developing the, uh, the surf scale was use, was I, uh, I did in-depth interviewing kind of a mixed methods approach, um, semi-formal interviews with, um, both people with and without dysphagia, um, and tried to make it, uh, non-directed, like non- non-leading um, to just kind of ask them about their experiences during mealtimes and um, whether or not, you know, their mealtimes experience was different compared to when they were, when they were younger or how their mealtimes may have changed. Um, and I should mention as well, I, um, a lot of this was a uh, hypothesis driven based on a framework of fatigue, of swallowing related fatigue that I had developed for an earlier study, um, which kind of helped guide those questions uh, and the types of questions that I was asking. Um, and, and then I went ahead and, uh, that, well, I tested this with additional participants or additional individuals with and without dysphagia. Um, and just did some cognitive interviewing with them about the types of questions that I was asking and whether or not um, they made sense or they, you know, for, for the types of fatigue or not that they were experiencing, uh, the types of just general mealtime experiences that they had. Um, and then uh, as well looked at um, or gave this scale to other um, speech language pathologists to get their perspective on it, but it's which with pathologists with 10 plus years experience. Um, but it is an ongoing process. Um, uh, developing a novel scale um, is, is challenging. Um, I think we do have some good preliminary data and I'm looking forward to continuing to develop this and refine it going forward. Thank you, very exciting work. Um, we will move to Jessica now. Hi, everybody. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yep. All right. Um, thank you for this opportunity to present. And um, I'm a fourth year student at Adelphi University and I work part-time as a medical SLP. And um, when I first entered uh, the PhD program, I thought about wanting to improve the bedside swallowing evaluation and improving the, the, the doing more quantitative measures in the evaluation as, a, as opposed to just some perceptual measures. So the first thing that I wanna do is look at the um, Val Acoustics. Is this not going? Okay. I wanna look at some Val Acoustics and I'm at the beginning stage of doing my research and the beginning stage of doing some data. So um, what I'm gonna do is do some Val acoustic measurements of three healthy age groups. And it's gonna be um, uh, younger, middle age, and then an older group. And the two Val acoustic measurements I'm gonna be using is the quadrilateral Val space area, and then the formant centralization ratio. And both of these um, quantify the Val measurements quantify the, the vowel productions by measuring the first two formants. And then we compare them to the norms and deter determine if there's any changes in production, even a slight change that we might not even be able to perceive when we're talking to them in conversation. So the quadrilateral vowel space 
we're looking at a two-dimensional area formed by the, um, the F1 and the F2. And then, and that's going to be of the four, four vowels of the um, quadrilateral. So we have the E, the A, ah, the U, and the A. Ah. And um, what pretty much happens is when people have um, a dysarthria, they could see a smaller area. So they have a limited range of getting to those appropriate productions of the vowels. So they are almost like undershoot the productions. So you see a smaller area. Now the four man centralization ratio, um, you take the, the F1 and the F2 measurements and you put them into this formula. And um, what we find is that the normal mean value for the FCR is at one. So anything at one or below is considered um, normal or functional. And then we go from there. So ideally what I'm gonna be doing is working on these two um, uh, Val acoustic measurements and then um, going from there and doing another study based on the, um, the swallowing. So my research question is, are acoustic valve measurements different in young, middle-aged, and older healthy participants measured by these two measures, the QVSA and the FCR? So with age, um, my hypothesis is pretty much, I think that the QVSA will systematically um, slightly reduce in age, and then the FCR measurements will increase with age. And um, that's what we just started doing with the data. So with the participants, we're gonna be evaluating um, 60 participants. So 20 um, in the age range of 18 to 35, 20 in the age range of 36 to 49, and then 20 in 50 to 75. We will have exclusion criteria, including if they already have dysphagia, if they have a tracheostomy, any previous speech abnormalities, speech um, of the speech mechanism or the hearing system, and um, if they have any changes with their vocal quality. If they have a wet vocal quality, if they have a hoarse vocal quality, they will be excluded from, from the, um, the study. So the methodology is pretty simple. They're going to be just sitting in a, um, upright in a chair and the same distance away from the computer. We're going to be using Pratt. They're going to be um, practicing two times in advance, producing the four vowels. And then they're going to be producing the vowels um, twice for at least three seconds each for a total of two times. So what we have first is just the, the younger individuals. So we have, we didn't even get 20 yet, but this is just the, um, the very um, small amount of data that we have so far. So remember that FCR has to be below one. So for the, um, the norm, Peterson and Barney, 1952, the norm is 0.8. So that is definitely below the one. And then for the younger one individuals minute. that we have so far, they're about 0.9. So, um, both of them under one. So the mean FCR for both of them is considered all, all normal. So now let's look at the, the quadrilateral vowel space area. Now this definitely has to have some analysis in order to tell exactly um, what's going on with the, the quadrilateral. Um, so um, the blue quadrilateral is the Peterson and Barney norms and then the young healthy are the green quadrilateral. So I think um, definitely in research, they say that the quadrilateral vowel space area has, um, it doesn't have, it actually has high um, interspeaker reliability. So not reliability, variability. So um, we really have to do an analysis with this to see exactly what's going on with, um, with the quadrilateral. Cause even if you change up the X axis and the Y axis, it could change where the quadrilaterals are, but um, pretty much they, um, they're a good, they're, they're actually a quadrilateral, which is good. And um, there's only so, just some variance about a hundred Hertz. So um, again, we're gonna do more analysis with, um, with the, the healthy subjects of the younger, the middle, as well as the, the older individuals. So where do we go from this? Like I said, we're gonna do the analysis for the three healthy age groups. And then the next study that we're going to be doing is the three healthy age groups. Um, we're going to do the acoustic measurements and then compare it with doing swallowing studies to see um, how the swallowing studies vary, vary from 
young to middle to, to um, the older age. And then um, finally from there, we can see, um, we can work with the, um, the patients that have dysphagia to see if there's any variance from the healthy individuals with the acoustics and doing the, um, the swallowing study and seeing um, if we can actually measure these valves and determine if we could um, ultimately in the future diagnose dysphagia with valve acoustics. Um, you know, there is a study by Park that says that the VCA and the FCR are significant factors for assessing dysphagia and um, predicting changes in the tongue and bowel move, um, jaw movement. So um, that will be our, our future goal and future study. Um, I just wanna thank my mentors who support me every, every step of the way, Dr. Cox, Dr. Randazzo and Dr. Wheeler. Thank you. Um, so we do have some questions in the chat. I actually asked a question, but then you answered it just on okay. the last slide. So thank you. Okay, for great. Um, and then from Karen, she wants to know um, like what the variability would be like for speakers of different languages. So for example, uh, Spanish speakers, um, I guess with respect to the vowel acoustics and the measurements. I think probably we would have to do another study with that. <laughs> so we're just gonna do English right now. And then probably maybe we can even run it with um, different languages. My husband speaks French and Arabic. So I would even love to do a, a study with Spanish and go across to some different languages. So def definitely um, I would say maybe do it in English and then do a comparison between English and, and different languages and then go from there. Yeah, it'd be interesting because the Spanish vowel space is considered to be narrower than the English vowel space. And so if you're predicting a narrowing with age, then you actually might see that across languages too. And then you'd have to kind of separate out those variables. Yeah, that would be really interesting to see. Um, and then what were your uh, specific screenings for voice and speech? Um, so right now we just have, we have a, um, a survey of... Um, asking them questions in terms of the, um, if they have any um, speech difficulties, if they have any um, uh, hearing difficulties, things like that. It's about like a 10, 10 question survey that we asked them prior to starting. Cool. Um, and then the regional differences in vowel productions or pronunciations, which I guess is similar to the question about Spanish speakers. Yeah, I would say we would do this region first, and then um, we would have to expand it to different regions so that we can get the comparisons there. And then the last question is, um, many individuals have with dysphagia have dysarthria, so how will your research differentiate those individuals? Um, by doing the fees. So we would have to do the, the instrumental swallowing evaluation and then you would differentiate between just the speech and impairment and then seeing the relationship between the, um, the vowel acoustics and the, um, the dysphagia by looking at the results of the fees. Great. Um, thank you so much, Jessica. Yeah. Um, we're going to move on to Thea now. Hi, my name is Thea Holder. I am a third year AUD student, so we're going to pivot a little bit to audiology. Um, so my research was on was looking for. Oh, stop moving. Okay, there we go. I was looking to investigate how confident audiologists feel in assessing and managing tinnitus and the types of methods that they use. I was also comparing what they responded to some current tinnitus guidelines that are out there. 
So it was an online survey that was distributed via link for about five months. We used different methods of getting the link out. We used some social media posts, um, we used some audiology organizations to send the letter out, to send the link out. It had 15 questions related to the confidence of tinnitus management, the type of tools they use for triaging, assessing, managing, and the type of manufacturers they use for hearing aids if they choose to do so for to manage the tinnitus. So some of the results that I found were, so the final data came from 61 audiologists. We sent this survey out to both audi to audiologists all around the world, but we got 70% from the United States, 30% from Canada. The clinical experience ranged from less than one year of experience to about 35 years. And the average confidence was about 72.5 with a standard deviation of about 21.5. This is just an example of what the questions look like. So some of our questions on assessment, just how do they assess the client? We focused on the basic audiometry, um, questionnaires, high frequency testing, loudness, discomfort levels, minimum masking level, levels, psychoacoustic measures, or acoustic emiss emissions testing. And for the management, we focus mainly on the counseling, sound therapy, and amplification. What we found was that after, of course, doing their pure tone audiometry to establish the thresholds, questionnaires, emittance testing, and pitch and loudness matching were the most common methods of assessment. And for the management, informational counseling um, was the most selected response by 92% of the respondents. Then hearing aid, sound therapy, and management counseling were all selected by about 75% or more of our respondents. So the summary of the current guidelines that are out there, we looked at guidelines provided by the American Academy of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery Foundation, it's a mouthful. Um, and then we also took a look at some of the recommendations from the American Academy of Audiology the American, and ASHA as well. So what we found was that the American Academy of Otolaryngology does not recommend using psychoacoustic measures, which is very interesting because they don't believe it aids in diagnosing or treating of treating the tinnitus, whereas both ASHA and AAA both recommend their use mainly for counseling purposes. We So looking back at our results here, we found that 68% of audiologists still perform them, even though it's not necessarily recommended in the guidelines. So ASHA also does not recommend loudness discomfort levels, while AAA does, and it wasn't addressed by the American Academy of Otolaryngology. And we found that 32% of audiologists still perform the, the, the LDLs. The American Academy of Otolaryngology strongly recommends the use of counseling. Sound therapy is listed as an optional management tool. Both AAA and ASHA recommend sound therapy for tinnitus. From our results, we found that 92% of audiologists perform informational counseling. That drops down a little bit to 80% for management counseling. And then it One drops minute. down just... Oh. Oh, it drops down just a little bit more to 78% um, performing sound therapy. So for another thing that is very interesting about what we found was that for OAEs, autoacoustic emissions testings, and extended high frequency testing going up to about 16,000 hertz, we found that none of the current major organizations addresses the use of that at all. It is talked about mainly in, um, by peer-reviewed literature. And we found that even though none of the organizations addresses it, 56% of audiologists perform the OAEs because they see it as beneficial, but only 32% of audiologists test extended high-frequency testing. So the survey revealed that few audiologists administer a truly comprehensive tinnitus assessment as indicated in published um, clinical practice guidelines and approximately 20% do not recommend counseling or sound therapy to manage tinnitus, which is very interesting. Standardizing tinnitus care may encourage audiologists' confidence and would ensure every patient is receiving equal care. And my references, thank you. Thank you so much, Thea. Are there any questions from the audience? 
Thanks, Thea. Um, so, um, oh, so we have a question from Karen. So she wants to know, can tinnitus care be standardized since the populations and causes are so heterogeneous? Um, that's a good question. I think that the way audiologists test tinnitus patients can be standardized. I've been in multiple clinics at this point, and I've seen that it varies based on the clinic. Somebody might come in and talk about their tinnitus, and the audiologist may recommend talking with an ENT to maybe determine a cause or looking more into it. Some people brush it off. So I feel like as long as we start just at least the treatment part of it, we can start to standardize. Management becomes a little bit more tricky. You would have to look more into maybe why there is tinnitus, but honestly, it, it is a little tricky. But as long as we have a set standard of tools that they can use, that can be very helpful. Um, and then Melissa also had a question um, about the gap between recommendations and what audiologists are currently doing in practice the gap between recommendations? Yeah, sorry. So I, my question was like half baked because I was typing and listening and I had started to type it and then I read Karen's question. So I'm sorry. Oh. Um, I guess, uh, you know, as you were talking, you're saying that there are some things that audiologists seem to continue to be doing, although they're no longer recommended or not part of the current mm -hmm. recommendation. So is it like a research to practice gap or just something that has routinely been part of these assessments? And so they just continue to keep it as part of the battery or both of those or something else? Um, I think a lot of it has to do with um, just what was maybe taught in while they were coming up in school or so forth. That's what they're following and not necessarily following the new research. But then again, you look at the OAE testing, which is not um, addressed by any of the organizations. That's just peer reviewed work and people are still continuing to do it. So I think it's a little bit of both. People are more so just picking and choosing what they think they may have time for or what they probably think is the most beneficial for the patient. Is it also a, a billing issue? Like, are they able to bill for separately for all of these different types of assessments and tests? I'm not, I'm not very sure. <laughs> I'm not sure on that, actually. Thank you. You're yeah, welcome. thank you so much, Thea. Um, our next speaker is Oren. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> thank you. This has been great. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I am Oren Abramowitz. I am a doctoral student at Adelphi University. I just defended my dissertation about a month ago. So uh, fresh off the presses, uh, theory of mind found, oh, also I should mention that my chair was Dr. Koenig and on my committee as well was Dr. Cox, who I saw here before. Nice to see you all and all, all the Adelphi people here. Nice, nice to see everyone here. So theory of mind following traumatic brain injury was the topic of my dissertation. Uh, just briefly, um, Traumatic brain injury is a subset of acquired brain injury. It's designated from other types of acquired brain injuries in that it's caused by an external blunt force trauma to the, to the head. And a defining symptom of traumatic brain injury are pragmatic deficits. So oftentimes individuals with traumatic brain injury uh, don't initiate conversations, have difficulty taking turns in conversations, although uh, uh, comment inappropriately, talk too much, talk too little. All of these things have uh, been cited as reasons for um, social isolation, social rejection and social isolation. And in fact, there have been some studies that, that have shown that loneliness has been the primary concern of people with traumatic brain injury, their caregivers, their friends, et cetera. Um, these social deficits that often accompany traumatic brain injury are similar to theory of mind deficits that have been implicated in other clinical populations, most, most prevalently in individuals with, uh, with, aut with autism. So there have been some thoughts as to whether the theory of mind deficits are underlying, are the underlying issue in traumatic brain injury as well. I don't have enough time to go into all of these studies, but there have been past research that did attempt to find a, a relationship between theory of mind and uh, impaired theory of mind and traumatic brain injury. 
and some have and some did not. However, there have been obstacles in, in testing that was used that really confounded the results. So for the most part, um, these tests were not developed for the traumatic brain injury population. In fact, they were developed for other specific populations and as such were embedded with executive functioning features, linguistic demands, memory demands, and all of those things are known to be disrupted in traumatic brain injury. Similarly, there have been other uh, studies that did not find a correlation, a correlation between theory of mind and traumatic brain injury. So there was a clear need to uh, research this further and see if, there, if such a relationship might exist. Another drawback to previous research is that there, haven't, there has not been a study that looked into the different components of theory of mind, cognitive theory of mind, and effective theory of mind in an adult traumatic brain injury population. It was once thought that theory of mind was a single neurological construct, but we now know better that there are different types of theory of mind, cognitive theory of mind, which is uh, implicating other people's thoughts, and effective theory of mind, which is a more empathic response. So the study had two basic research questions. One, will there be a difference in theory of mind between a TBI group and a neurotypical group as assessed by um, the why-how paradigm? And the second question uh, was whether there was going to be differences in cognitive and effective theory of mind within the traumatic brain injury group. The hypothesis for that one was that effective theory of mind was going to be worse than cognitive theory of mind in the traumatic brain injury group. And the hypothesis for the first question was that the TBI group would, would exhibit significantly worse scores than the neurotypical group. In the study, there were 44 participants, 22 were in each group. They were, there was an attempt to match each by age, education, um, and handedness, and, and gender and sex. Uh, there, this was accomplished. They were matched by age, gender, and handedness. However, there was a significant difference in education between the, T, the TBI group and the neurotypical group with the neurotypical group attaining a higher level of education. The procedure for, the, uh, for testing uh, was fairly similar for both groups. After consent was obtained, uh, both uh, groups had to go through screenings, uh, auditory comprehension screening and a reading comprehension screening because, of, the, because, of, because of the components of the theory of mind testing. I'll move on since I only have one minute and just get to the results. So in terms of the first research question, the TBI group did score worse than the neurotypical group. The TBI group is in blue. The neurotypical group is in orange here. Um, so on the, the Y-How test as a whole, the TBI group scored significantly worse. How questions, which are uh, intentional action questions, the TBI group scored worse than the neurotypical group, and why questions, which are mental inferencing questions or theory of mind questions, the TBI group did score worse. Uh, response time data was also reported. Uh, I'm sorry, this is accuracy um, uh, uh, within groups where the why questions were answered worse than the how questions. Again, that's expected since why questions are theory of mind questions. So in summary, uh, all measures of uh, the Y How test, the TBI group scored worse than the neurotypical group. Um, response time also was, was higher. So the Yoni test was used for cognitive and effective theory of mind. There was no significant difference in either group uh, between cognitive and effective scores. So the hypothesis that the uh, TBI group would score worse in effective theory of mind did not come to fruition in terms of accuracy data. However, there was a significant difference in the TBI group in um, between cognitive and effective uh, scores with response time. So within the TBI group, the, they took longer with cognitive theory, with cognitive uh, items than with effective items. So there was a significant difference. It was a bit surprising because the, again, the, the hypothesis was that effective items would be more difficult. And if they were more difficult, we would expect those to take more time, um, but that was not the case. However, there were still some important findings within the Yoni test um, in that um, there was a significant, even though there wasn't a significant difference in accuracy, there was a significant difference in response time. Um, and and uh, even though that was not, uh, that, that did not go according to hypothesis, it, 
demonstrates that accuracy alone is not sufficient in determining uh, theory of mind abilities in individuals following traumatic brain injury. Um, it's particularly important for the TBI group, for a TBI group who have shown to do worse in timed tasks. Um, so that also has to be taken into consideration. Um, all right, and I think I will end it there. Thank you. Um, we have a few questions. So Karen wants to know about specific factors that you controlled for. So severity, age at onset, time since onset, um, localization of function and effects of rehabilitation, neuroplasticity. Um, yes. That's so, so there was there was a correlation done for severity, which demonstrated that those who had more uh, significant uh, cognitive deficits did score worse on both tests of theory of mind. It was not controlled for, but it was reported on uh, in the study. Um, time since onset was not controlled for. Localization was not controlled for. Um, yeah. Was there anything else in that? Uh, well. Um localization of function and effects of rehabilitation. Yeah, age at onset. I was just really thinking about the many, many other factors associated with TBI, which in itself is not a unitary phenomenon, and how those would interact with theory of mind, which, as you rightly point out, is not a unitary phenomenon either, and that right. there are so many factors that are probably mediating the, uh, the effects that you observed. Yeah, it's such it's so difficult. All all TBI research, you know, is is always with the caveat that this is a very heterogeneous population. This is a very heterogeneous group. Um, so yeah, rather than attempt to control for them, there were analyses done that tried to explain them. Great. Um, now there was a significant difference in the two groups uh, with education level. So Mariana wants to know what the effects were of education level in the results, if you ran well, that analysis. Yeah, so education level was confounded with group. So it was, it was really difficult to, to um, this is a definite, you know, if I had my time for my slides for limitations, this is, this is A1 you know, listed on, on limitations. So educational level does not, did not match. Now, the, on a theoretical grounds, it can be argued that theory of mind should not be reliant on education level uh, uh, for the TBI group because all of the participants in this study acquired their brain injury well past the points of acquisition for theory of mind mileposts. Um, there have been other studies with TBI participants theory of mind and TBI participants in which education levels were matched and it was not shown as a confounding factor, but obviously it's a great limitation for this study. And then Jason wanted to know if the RTs were slower in general with this population, um, with your TBI population, and were you able to use a control stimulus in RT? What do you mean by control stimulus? You were collecting, sorry, hi. Um, hi. If you were collecting uh, reaction time uh, data on the measures that you were using, um, perhaps having another stimuli that wasn't related to your task specifically, but that would also be collecting reaction times just to see if they were just slower in general to your control group versus slower because of the theory of mind tasks. No, that would have been a great, that would be great, but I, it was not done, yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah, of course, I, I think so. Um, I'd imagine that they would be slower overall, um, but no, that was not done. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I lecture and think about theory of mind on the other end of the age spectrum in children, so it was really nice to see it in an adult. Um, neurogenic population. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, next up, we have uh, Ken Anderson. All right. Can everyone uh, see my slide? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. So um, my research, research does follow um, Orens in a little bit. 
Um, my, research, my research it stems from the recent uh, literature on the characteristics of ASD and how they're expressed differently in females. Uh, as you can see, we know the prevalence of ASD has increased significantly over the past several years. A lot of that has to do with awareness. Um, the stigma of autism has decreased and also with uh, updates to the DSM. But within that, we've also highlighted more of the subgroup, the females, and uh, the literature that's out there is quite interesting. So what we know in ASD, how it expresses itself. So in females, there's fewer or camouflaged uh, repetitive stereotype behaviors. There's more internalization of emotions and increased anxiety. And they also have been shown to have stronger empathy abilities. And what this means is that it has resulted in less representation in ASD research. Um, there's a delayed age of identification and diagnosis, which also leads to um, delayed treatment. Um, misdiagnosis, oftentimes because of the um, kind of camouflage effect that it creates. Sometimes it can be more diagnosed more as just like a, a social disorder um, or something similar. And then also it has resulted in less educational support compared to their male counterparts. So these are some of the discrepancies and, uh, that have kind of guided my research in trying to shed more light on females with ASD and hopefully to provide more representation uh, and treatment. So uh, my study is titled Differences in Processing Emotional Expressions Versus Intentional Actions Between Neurotypicals and Individuals with ASD Level 1. Um, now, the reason level one is important, uh, historically, the terms that we use to describe autism have been mild, moderate, severe, or high functioning versus low functioning. Um, but I want to use, the DSM currently uses uh, three levels based on the need of support. So instead, we're kind of moving away from some of those mild, moderate, severe terms to uh, correlating to the levels of support with the DSM. And level one um, would, is kind of what would be considered high-functioning autism, even though there is no set criteria for what high-functioning autism is. So we're using the DSM. So the purpose of the study, uh, the aim of the current study is to explore the relationship between sex and ASD expression using EEG. Uh, our study investigates emotional expressions and intentional action, processing differences between neurotypicals and individuals with ASD. Uh, so we're gonna compare between those groups and then within the groups, males and females to see if there's a significant difference in that ability. And hopefully, our research will provide more additional support for the uh, female phenotype, uh, which will lead to improved diagnostic measures and interventions. So um, this is the why how task also used by Oren. This task um, shows uh, pictures of hand actions and emotional expression. So kind of more concrete actions versus emotional expressions, which are, can be subtle and therefore a little bit more, more difficult to uh, distinguish. So I won't go over EEG, but what we're going to get is the waveform, um, which will help us, we, gives us reaction time, amplitude, latency. So what we want to compare is see if there's a correlation between, we're going to use the autism quotient to determine autism traits, empathy quotient to determine empathy skills, compare that with accuracy on the why how task, compare that with the reaction time, and then look at the amplitude of the N170 and the L, the late positive potential, which are known to elicit, be elicited in response to facial processing and emotions. Uh, we have some preliminary, uh, preliminary uh, results, but it is only with our neurotypical comparison group. Therefore, it does show that they are very similar, uh, which is what we would expect. 
um, so far. We wouldn't, uh, hopefully, once we get our ASD population, we'll see a more significant difference. Um, so here, males and females, very similar uh, in results so far. Uh, but we have shown, uh, we have seen a late positive potential. We've also seen some other ERP components, uh, the N100, N200, and N400, but we're gonna continue looking at that as we gather more uh, data. And uh, my committee, thank you for all. There have been wonderful support so far. And um, we have time for questions. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Oren. Are you yes. going? To, are you going to analyze why question why questions separately from how how questions or the test as a whole? So yes, we're going to break it down again: males, females, uh, between groups, between the sexes, uh, comparing why versus how, emotion versus action, um, and looking at amplitude, latency, accuracy. Um, in all of those things. So there's going to be lots of variables to consider. We're just not there yet. And from Karen, uh, she wants to know, can you clarify the predictions for the ERP components with uh, the aspects of like empathy um, and the- so, yes. <laughs> with more control. time, we do, we do have predictions. Um, we within um, obviously between neurotypicals and the ASD group, we do we would expect um, to see um, increased reaction time with the ASD group, um, decrease uh, less amplitude, um, less accuracy. But what we're predicting is that between the groups, females. Um, you know, we're predicting that they might show a slightly higher um, emp with empathy scores, higher empathy should correlate with um, higher accuracy, increased amplitude, uh, shorter uh, reaction times. Um, but again, with that'll be very interesting once we get the ASD population to see what those differences are. Yeah, really well. I don't think I've seen this task applied in that way. Um, and to see empathy quotient and autism quotient correlated with N170 amplitude, the LPP you're going to find even more challenging. That is a crazy yeah. all the way out there. Good luck. Okay. This, this is cool. Thank you. Thank you. Ken, I'm, I'm curious why you're not using a, a, the tried and true false belief tests like the Sally Ann test. <laughs> Um, yes, just, I mean, that is something that has been used so much. And I do, uh, going back to Oren's point, the, the why, how task was created, um, in the hopes of getting a standardized, uh, theory of mind assessment that can be used has a broad application to many populations. And therefore we can kind of compare and contrast more more studies so that's that's where that's the reasons why we're using the why how task instead of one of the more traditional tasks gotcha thank you thank you so much ken um all right we, thank you we'll now move on to jason all right let me switch over All right, uh, thank you for having me. Um, this is, uh, my presentation is on self-efficacy of speech language pathologists at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, sorry, I didn't start off by introducing myself. My name is Jason Rosas and I am a PhD candidate at the CUNY Graduate Center in the Department of Speech Language and Hearing Sciences. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic forced many professions to transition from in-person service delivery to remote service delivery in the spring of 2020. Professionals who work with pediatric clients, like speech pathologists, were particularly affected. Um, 
it's certainly the case that everyone wanted to uh, switch into a remote mode in order to decrease uh, the spread of infection from uh, the COVID-19 uh, um, virus. But in addition, uh, there was very little information about how the virus would affect children. So it's particularly important to keep them safe during that, that period of time. The vast majority of SLPs did not have experience using uh, teletherapy, however, and especially with uh, pediatric clients even though you would have expected them to uh, have great skill in using uh, teletherapy um, because of their expertise in the profession of communication. So nevertheless, hundreds of thousands of children nationwide received services due to the efforts of these speech language pathologists during that pandemic. Uh, my questions were really uh, centered more so on the experiences of the SLPs. What was the experience like for SLPs during that period of time? And could we develop a model or can we use a model to, that represents their behavior changes that were necessary um, in order to respond to the pandemic? Um, I chose a model uh, based on professional identity development. Individuals form their professional identities based on motivating factors that interact with your professional environment. These motivating factors can be thought of as fulfilling elementary needs, such as developing autonomy in their actions or their therapeutic practices, engaging with others to meet their professional aims or their interpersonal engagement, or, and improving their self-efficacy efficacy and perception of effectiveness in the profession or their intrapersonal uh, assimilation. Um, for the purposes of this uh, uh, talk, what I will be focusing on is on the intrapersonal assimilation process. And in order to do that, we are going to rely on Bandura's model of self-efficacy, which served as a framework for the questions in the survey that I conducted that focused on self uh, Bandura argues that uh, there are four, source, four sources that contribute to a person's uh, rating of self-efficacy. Um, self-efficacy being defined as the degree of confidence that a person has in their skills. These um, uh, sources include mastery experience, which is uh, the person uh, continuously doing the task and therefore feeling like they have mastery over it. Um, vicarious experience, which is watching someone else do the task and feeling like they've learned a lot and, and feeling that they feel confident and competent because of, because of their watching someone else. Verbal persuasion, which is listening or being convinced because people are telling you that you're very good at your skill and that they can do it. And uh, physiological states, which is uh, linked up to their feelings, uh, persevering despite any unease that they might have in uh, performing a task. These uh, four sources together influence self-efficacy, which in turn influences a person's behaviors. So my research questions were, how did the transition to teletherapy affect SLP's intrapersonal assimilation process? Specifically, I asked two questions. How did SLP self-efficacy change as a function of the transition from in-person therapy services to remote the teletherapy services? And which sources, according to Bandura's model, did SLPs identify as influencing their self-efficacy during in-person therapy versus teletherapy? My hypotheses was, were that SLPs were, will experience a decrease in their clinical competence, as measured by self-efficacy, in response to the shift to teletherapy. Um, number two, SLPs will assimilate to the shift uh, to teletherapy and report an increase in their clinical competence after using teletherapy for one month. SLPs mm -hmm. will identify uh, mastery experiences other, over other sources that contribute to self-efficacy, and they will... Um, identify physiological states over other sources when reflecting on their remote therapy self-efficacy levels. I used a survey um, where I distributed nationally to clinicians that worked in schools, healthcare facilities, and private practices. Um, we got 262 responses, and the survey consisted of 92 questions, but I'm only going to go over six of the questions. Um, the questions were uh, based on a five-point Likert scale, rate how clinically competent you feel when delivering services in person, um, when they first transitioned to teletherapy, and today, which was for them, approximately one month after the tele teletherapy services were initiated. I then asked them to identify which of the four sources below um, influenced their ratings of self-efficacy. As you can see here, the individuals in, this is a summary of the, in of the, 
respondents responses uh, in blue referring to how um, self uh, how self-efficacious they felt in person and in orange in their early remote period. And as you can see, they were certainly uh, uh, identifying high levels of competence in, uh, in person, and that shifted dramatically during when they shifted to um, remote services. But about a month later, the shift started to go back in the opposite direction again, uh, uh, skewing back towards uh, higher uh, competency ratings. So if we're looking at the, uh, at the trends of these uh, three graphs, what you see is that there is, in fact, a shift that first goes down and then shifts back up. Uh, this was significant, uh, as, as noted by uh, Friedman's two-way ANOVA. And it's, as far as their uh, self-efficacy ratings with regards to the factors that contributed to them, mastery uh, of experiences was, in fact, the most um, identified source in their in-person in in um, self-efficacy work. And that shifted toward the other sources when they moved to early um, remote uh, teletherapy. And the later remote therapy uh, also so showed some differences, but as since things they were using all of the um, sources at that point, since now they were using more of experiencing more mastery experiences, the main um, significant difference was uh, in uh, physiological states being used more so than vicarious. Thank you. I'm going to skip the conclusions because I guess we can have some questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? Oh, Karen, um, strikes me that mastery is a conglomerate of vicarious plus verbal plus physiological experiences. Can these really be separated in terms of how they contribute to efficacy? Well, and it, from Bandura's models, they would argue that um, you don't have, you can view someone doing a task and not be doing it yourself. So in the mastery of experiences, the person is gaining mastery by doing the task themselves. In vicarious experiences, they are seeing someone do the task, but not engaging in it themselves. Um, in verbal persuasion, they are being convinced. They're being told what to do. They're being encouraged in what to do. But again, the person is still not doing it. And the physiological experience is, again, the the feeling that you're going to overcome and start doing the work, even though you haven't started doing it yet. So um, from this perspective, it's only in the doing that you actually get better. And that's why they all, in, when they were referring to their self-efficacy with regards to their in-person, everybody was really uh, highlighting, well, I feel like I'm really good at it because I've been doing it for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but then when they switched to uh, teletherapy, they had no experience of actually doing it. And so they switched to using the other sources. That's it, I guess. I guess there are no further questions. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, this was a really exciting first data blitz, and we're really grateful to all of our presenters and for all of the attendees for asking your fantastic questions. Um, so as we say at the NYC DCS, thank you for keeping our research community vibrant. We'll let you all know when uh, the video is up on the YouTube channel and then also hopefully we'll link you to looking at some of our other talks and uh, we'll keep you posted of our following events. Um, if anyone wanted to stay on and ask further questions, you know, we can leave the Zoom open for a few minutes, um, but otherwise have a great night. Um, on behalf of the committee, we're really happy to see all of you. Thanks so much. Thanks for inviting us. Thank you, thank you all. Yes, thank you.